think he wins the furthest away award. He's come all the way from Vancouver Island. I always pronounce this wrong. Is it Couchin? Couchin. Um, uh, Biodiesel Co-op. They were the host of uh, this conference a couple years back. And uh, this topic is going to be about point of sale. This is about the interface. This is about how to get B100 to the people and some of the technologies to do that. Brian's got some ideas. And the guys from Baltimore Biodiesel are here. And they're also going to contribute to this conversation because they also have technology in play. Uh, which, by the way, we're operating down in the yard at the plant. So if anybody wants to look at the Baltimore Biodiesel system, it's one of the things we use to dispense fuel. So I'm really intensely interested in this conversation. Take it away. Right, so thanks so much a lot. And so um, one of the key things about this, this presentation is we're going to be talking a little bit about you know, really the, the important thing. I don't know if uh, every, anyone's ever seen the story of stuff. They talk about it as a golden arrow, the consumer, really, because we spend a lot of time at the CBC talking about how to collect and how to process, and then yet we don't have a really good system for getting it out and really uh, attracting a mass market for our, our product. And really, that if we're, if we're missing that, then we're not living up to the full potential of the product that we're creating, right, and getting it out to the, to the masses. So this is really a key, product, um, a key part of the whole equation. And I know that right now that I am in the most challenging after lunch presentation time slot. <laughs> so before everyone all drifts off and goes to sleep, I'd like you to do one thing for me. Can everyone please stand up? Can everyone stand up? Okay, and I want you to turn around and keep on turning around until you see someone that you don't know yet. And stop. And I want you to stop when you see someone you don't know and introduce yourself. Uh, just really quickly. Really quickly. Not a life story. Really. You're just getting to the key essentials. And remember, we're at Swiss Train here at CBC. Switch training. Excellent. Thank you so much. Because really, at these conferences, you never know the resource that's sitting right beside you or the friendships that you're going to make. And I think that's what's kept this thing going for so long, too. It's not only just this resource, it's like this great self help group that we know uh, each other's pain. And so, with that, I kind of want to start with just a really, really quick story uh, about the CDC. And first of all, I want you all to know recognize that, yes, I'm wearing a t-shirt with a moose on it. <laughs> and uh, that's just to let you know that, that I'm Canadian. And really, to be truly Canadian, I think you can't be Canadian unless you have some kind of story that has a moose in it, a beaver, <laughs> or a grizzly bear. You've got to have one of those three things. Oh, I'm sorry, well, you're not you're Canadian. Canadian. You've been too urbanized. <laughs> so um, I managed to get the businesses to the point where this year I was able to take two weeks off in a place where there was no internet and there was no cell phone coverage. It was a beautiful thing. I canoed down the Yukon River into Dawson City, spent six days on the Yukon River. Beautiful experience. The day that I got in to Dawson City just happened to be the day of this huge feast at this native community down the river called Moose High. And so my girlfriend Emily and I kind of cleaned ourselves up and thought, wow, we can't miss this. And so we went to Moose High and found that there was this gathering that had been going on and really for a long time before, um, you know, before we got to it. Uh, before there was ever any settlement, the, uh, the First Nations there, and in Canada, um, Native populations called themselves First Nations to get away from that whole mistake about being mistaken for the continent of, you know, India. Um, they're not Indians <laughs> in Canada. So, in, um, so at Moose High, they have this celebration, and because they're on a river, people on journeys would stop there, and they, had this, they would have this feast, and when people would you know, stop and enjoy their hospitality, and they would pay for, they basically, they would uh, share their, in their abundance. They'd have food and they'd share with people, and when people went on, boat on their way, on their individual journey, they would give them food to take on their way, to sustain them. And, uh, and so when they went to their communities, they would do the same thing. And I thought, wow, that is the early CBC right there. Because what we're, what we're doing is pre-history CBC. Because that's what, exactly what we're doing here. We're getting together and we're really sustaining ourselves. We're all traveling on our own individual journeys. We come here, we get this great intellectual and, I don't know, spiritual food. And we kind of take that with us and we go back on our individual journeys. And then with this rotating host, it could happen somewhere else. And then we host, we do it all over again. 
So that's just my kind of quick story about the, uh, about the CDC, um, and that yes, this is the CDC, and you are, if you're wondering what a moose gathering is, you're at one right now. <laughs> so, to start off, uh, my name's uh, Brian Roberts, and I've been involved, like my day jobs have been everything from the public sector to the private sector. Uh, I work for Vancouver Island University part-time too, I teach, but my real passion has been social enterprise initiatives. And of that, sustainable biofuels. And so why sustainable biofuels? Well, we all know the story by now. And for me personally, it was the apparition of Rudolf Diesel who spoke to me one night and said, Brian, the future is the past. Rudolf Diesel, the future. Bob. So um, we've had some success with that. So we uh, run a, a biofuel facility in a very small community, rural, very much like Pittsburgh. When I come here, I really feel like I'm at home. There's a lot of uh, organic agriculture, progressive community, small community, but a biofuel facility. Not quite as big as Piedmont, but we're working on it. In 2011, we hosted the, uh, the Collective Biofuel Conference, and in 2010, the, the Collective Biofuel Conference was essentially dead. Um, and we resurrected it. We reanimated the, uh, the corpse. Um, we came up with this rotating host model and then put it out to the rest of the world. And happy to say, it lives. <laughs> and uh, as, uh, as Lyle says, now I think the fact that it's really started to, um, I guess, take root again and really grow, now we're back in Mecca. We've come back to North Carolina, to Piedmont, where so much has started, so much inspiration has come from. So I think this is a really special uh, CDC this year. Um, a little bit about our initiatives and so how we, how we operate. We have three organizations uh, going on five, and that seems like a really, really complicated model. But we have a private, um, for-profit, uh, employee-owned company called Recycle that does a waste cooking oil collection. They um, take that to the biofuel facility where a non-profit, Couch and Energy Alternatives, does the production. And as a non-profit, they can apply for grants, research grants, all sorts of money that a private company can't. And it's a member of the Couch and Biodiesel Co-op where the distribution happens. So, you know, I could spend an entire uh, presentation just talking about that, um, but if you're interested, I can talk to you offline about it. Um, now, we've also formed another organization called the BC Biofuel Network, and that's not just us, that's all different co-ops in BC to get together and to share, um, share resources, uh, research, and uh, to put our heads together for solutions. And more recently, we also started something called the Community Carbon Marketplace to actually monetize the greenhouse gas reductions from the uh, aggregated uh, greenhouse gas reductions from the aggregated use of all the, uh, all the biodiesel. That is now a significant part of our revenue, um, believe it or not. But really, um, so what that does, that, for us, that kind of changes this model a little bit now. And so we measure, we're measuring the environmental benefit. And that environmental benefit can now turn out into a monetary benefit, and it has, because we sell that to local governments and industry. Um, but that's not what this is about. This is about biodiesel sales. And really, this is probably one of the most important, and I think kind of underlooked, uh, subjects at the CDC. So I'd like to kind of change that and, uh, and look a little bit more, focus a little bit more on this, and how we're gonna really bust <coughs> in controlling the sales market. Because really, this is one of the main limitations, the main bottlenecks for us getting our product out for more mass use. It's not like we're going to walk up to BP and just knock on the door and say, hey, can you give us a pump at your, you know, your outlets? It's not going to work that way. So we have to be smart, we have to be resourceful, and we have to do this cheap because none of us are millionaires. So that's what this is kind of about. And so with that, I want to talk about the evolution of biofuel distribution. So for us, we started out like so many different co-ops, like how do, you, how do you get this to market? Well, we started out by selling it by the jug at the Duncan Farmers Market. And really, this was one of the smartest things we did at the start, we got so much uh, attention for this. We got a core following of people. Many of them are still with us. They're just absolutely loyal. Um, and they just love the idea of going and get a jug of biodiesel with their carrots at the same time. Um, messy, it involved us most of the time walking the jug over and filling up the car, but it was fun. We moved to the uh, slightly less primitive system of using uh, a fill right, and we opened up the island's first uh, B100 pump. Uh, with this, and we started getting some press, thus the posed pictures, starting to get a little bit more media savvy. Uh, but one thing that we really overlooked was 
having the fill right pump in the media story, uh, and you can probably almost even make out not for commercial sale. And it was unbelievable the response we got. We had this, this media event on a Saturday and Monday before 8.30, before government offices even officially opened, we had a call from Weights and Measures Canada. <laughs> yes, so I think we uh, pretty effectively talked, you know, educated them about the co-op model and why we're not the public, we're a private group. But the thing is, we never really felt confident that we won that argument. They went away, but we knew that we had to come up with a different solution. And so the other thing that was an issue, of course, too, weights, you know, besides Weights and Measures, was the fact that our point of sale system here, which you can't see, was of course a mailbox and an envelope and trust. And so once you start, that's great when you know all your co-op members, and then suddenly when you're trying to, when you're trying to get co-op members at the pump, or you have more people that you don't even know, that system doesn't work anymore. But it worked for us for quite a while, and largely because I think we had a manned um, like booth there, because we partnered with a local gas station. This is Darcy from Couch and Petroleum Sales just an absolute saint of a man. He basically just hosts our, our pump there. We bring him extra business, get him good PR, and uh, he lets us you know, cohabitate with him. Um, but yes, we needed another solution there, not just for ways and measures, but for us, and we knew that this was a temporary uh, solution. So we got a B100 card lock service, and this was absolutely you know, top of line for us at the time. Magnetic, uh, it has these little magnetic cards, uh, and uh, so you can uh, load them up. Uh, a co-op member has to come into the office to manually put money on, or they, we started out with this, we also had this PayPal feature where you can just put some money into a PayPal account, but then it takes someone in the office and next business day to manually put it on the account. So top of the line, yes, circa 1990s. Uh, complete with the fax modem screeching sound when co-op members you know, have their, uh, their money put onto their account. So not really, again, uh, a solution for mass appeal. And so, but from this we got another grand opening and another press release. So now with, with the uh, Banker Island's uh, first B100 card block, you gotta, you gotta milk the media and the attention that you can get. Um, and from this, later on, we started evolving. We got on our first commercial client, our first fleet. Fortunately for us, they wanted to use B100. And um, actually, they, they made the claim that they were the first bus company in North America to use B100. Fantastic. Um, and of course, we didn't have to worry about all those different warranty issues um, for, or trying to mix or blend. Perfect. Um, that led to another key partner coming on the Couch and Valley Regional District, our local government, and absolutely fantastic, progressive local government. They've been so supportive of, of us. We co-locate um, our biofuel facility on their solid waste management uh, transfer station, so that's where all the recycling happens in the region. And now there's just one more thing that you can recycle, waste cooking oil there, and we take care of all that, process it into biodiesel. They're committed also to purchase biodiesel to meet carbon neutral commitments, because we have a carbon tax and uh, basically a carbon market in British Columbia, one of the reasons why we even sell the credits. And so that's very important to them. The problem is that fleet vehicles on warranty need B5 or B20. And uh, we were in a blending uh, facility. And early in our mandate, we weren't anything, we didn't want anything to do with petroleum um, products. But here's a local government that wants to do the right thing. They can only use B20 at most. And uh, we also realized that with, uh, with cold flow issues, we had a particularly cold winter um, on Vancouver Island. It dropped all the way down to around uh, minus 10 degrees Celsius. I think it's maybe around 10 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe 50, something like that. And we had still had a summer blend in the, uh, in the tank, which caused us quite a few problems. So from that, we decided to change. We had a, two, uh, two, uh, a split tank. We had SVO on one side. We had Bidies on the other. From that moment, we changed to a B50 blend for winter and a B100 blend, and also so that people who are a little bit wary about the B100 but can still get 50% of the benefits. We don't want to exclude those people. We're all about trying to include uh, more people, get more people to use it, um, and again, maximize the, uh, the greenhouse gas reduction benefit. So that was a problem, and we needed a solution to that. Um, the problem, again, with this, you know, aging limited, uh, this is aging equipment, limited blends, and accessibility. So. We came up with a solution. 
smart, sexy looking blending pump and point of sale system. Look at that. That is a uh, dresser weighing pump. Uh, it comes with blending. We have a B5, B20, B50, and B100 option on that. So we can cover all the warranty spectrum, plus vehicles that are off warranty. Um, the CBRD vehicles that are off warranty can go to B100 in the summer and B50 in the, uh, in the winter. We maximize the uh, greenhouse gas reduction potential of our distribution now. Um, and of course, this wing dresser pump is a surplus pump. We did not buy this new. We got this probably for a couple thousand dollars. It looked like crap when we got it, but a little wrap, wow, that looks good. Um, and we're starting to look for some mass appeal now. And the CBRD, our local government, great kudos, great press release this. Now we're starting to get somewhere. So, um, but there's a problem. We need a robust but inexpensive way to interface these surplus pumps with the point of sale system because the, uh, we don't have a lot of these and if our model is gonna to be to create more and more pumps, and it is, we're not gonna buy these things new and we're not gonna get the off-the-shelf point of sale system and licensing. It's just too expensive. That's, if we're a petroleum service company, yes, we're not. So we have a, a really big problem here. Plus if we wanna use this uh, point of sale system with our old pump, that's only got B50 and B100, we've got a completely different pump here too. So the, the, the off-the-shelf uh, dresser weighing point of sale system uh, that goes with this, we'll, we'll work with that. So we have a problem and we uh, also want to make sure that we are point of sale system this time. We need a solution that doesn't involve envelopes and a mailbox built into the side of this. What is that working on? What's that? What is that a credit card? Oh, I'll get to that. Yeah, okay. Okay, right now, that's a picture of it with nothing. So this is only usable by the CBRD. So, and, and our partnership is to open this up to members and to expand use for the entire community. So that's not a public pump. What's that? That's not a public pump. That's it's just, not a public pump. That's just it can't be because there's no way to keep track yeah, yeah, of all the different people. That. It's just being used by the Couch and Valley Regional District. Yeah. And because of that great partnership and the fact that in, we're in a rural community, 73% of the greenhouse gases produced in our community come from driving because everyone has to drive everywhere. We don't have good, good transit. Um, yes? Is that a two tank system? It's a two tank system. Two tank. That's right. Full, all these one, one B100 and the other. So, how do we solve this? Well, we came up with a BC collaborative approach, uh, development of a point of sale system based on the software created by Luke Close of the Vancouver Bionics of Co-op. And so, we took this collaborative approach um, and just piggyback on what they did and just try and make this fit with, with what we have. Um, and with, you know, starry eyes and uh, all the naivety that you usually have when you go into something that you know nothing about. Uh, and we thought, I could say, we could just, it would just be a patch. Um, what's that? Our <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, <clears throat> this is basically how it's designed and it's just really, really simple. I'm going over this pretty quickly um, and there'll be more detail later on in the presentation about the point of sale system because we're going to be looking at Gilead's uh, system in more detail. Um, so obviously the pump is the important thing, this is what we know about. And we brought on some uh, software and hardware developers who basically looked at the pump and created uh, a uh, firmware that interfaces with the pump itself so that uh, we used something called a Raspberry Pi, it's just a little tiny computer. You just put it inside the pump, you hook it up to all the right things, basically the, uh, we hooked it up to the, um, basically to the display, so it takes the, uh, the fuel uh, volume and price right from the display. Actually, it doesn't take the price, it takes just the volume, and then we program the price on an online, um, basically our online uh, uh, system or database. So then there is a Wi-Fi um, that uh, basically is attached to that. There's a consumer interface where you can enter your passcode. It, ours doesn't have a credit reader, a credit card reader. You just have a passcode, um, and you put uh, all your um, information online. You set an account up. We use a company called Beanstream that keeps all the credit card information separate from the actual uh, client database, and yeah, it connects. It's all in the cloud. So it seemed like a really good system that worked for that wing dresser pump. So we have now got something, it's a really a beta system that, uh, that's working, it's only working with that pump. We're just testing it right now, so we don't have a lot of uh, results to share with you. I'm sure it's gonna be a bit of a, you know, a trial and error process too, but for the most part, 
it's, it's operating, and probably in the next month or so, we're going to be inviting our co-op members to start using it after we finish the pilot with, uh, with the CDRD and their fleet. Um, and so now the problem is that further investment is needed for widespread application because this system that we have only works with that dresser weight pump. So now we have to do some research and look at how you know what data stream we're going to we're going to read from the older pumps that we have um, to be able to make it work with this. Uh, and to try and standardize it. So, because we already have interest, our next pump is going to be in Victoria. We have interest down there with the Island Biodiesel Co-op of a collaborative approach to uh, um, to create a pump for them. Uh, we want to be able to create a system that is usable by all the co-op members in BC, so that a, a member from the, the Vancouver Co-op can get fuel in Cowichan, and the Cowichan member can get fuel from from uh, Victoria, and, and likewise, because then we've effectively more than tripled our co-op membership base as well uh, by, by doing that. And really, here we are, we're talking about local solutions, but fuel is a, you know, biofuel is a transportation fuel. It's taken out of your locale uh, when you need to. And if there's nowhere you can get fuel when you're outside of your locale, well, what are you going to do besides you know, load up with jugs everywhere you go, which is what so many of us, uh, um, I guess, in the more community will do. So here we are. We're kind of at a little bit of an impasse. And we, and, and we thought, what do we do now? Um, and so we thought, well, this was way more involved than we thought. We ended up, like I said, we, we had this software system. We thought it'd be relatively easy, but it, there was a big learning curve here. And probably around $15,000 of investment went in, which probably wasn't that, that bad. But um, by the time the firmware was set up, by the time all the patches and all the extra um, programming was written in the software, because we needed a, a blending function, because the Vancouver Co-op only had the B100 sale. So we needed something to keep track of the biodiesel versus the, the regular diesel, um, all those sorts of things. And so now we thought, okay, so before we do any more investment, uh, we want to kind of take a little bit more of a, a lay of the land. And, uh, and it was around this time also when we were thinking about our next steps that we found out about this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I love this photo. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the movie Doctor Strange Love. It is one of my favorite movies of all time. This is Slim Pickens riding the nuke, the nuke down out of the Bombay doors. Beautiful. It was Take also posed for that purpose. Exactly. Beautiful. Yeah, I got it. I got it right away. So this is the nuke being dropped on the petroleum industry. That's what I like to think. Anyways, so we took a big step back. And I wrote a, a proposal to some of our funders uh, to do a feasibility study. And fortunately, we won this social enterprise dragon's den that happened on, on Vancouver Island, and we got some money to do it. So we took a big step back, and we decided we were going to do a feasibility study because we, you know, the more we got into this, the more we realized this isn't just a quick fix, and this is a bigger, um, this is bigger than just us. Because if we do, <coughs> if we need this. There's a lot more people that need this also. Uh, all through the collective biofuel community. And so what we did was we took a step back, we, uh, we decided we wanted to look at defining the ideal distribution system to access the larger petroleum sales market. And so we did a survey of uh, North American uh, biodiesel cooperatives basically using the collective uh, uh, biodiesel conference list. And so most of you would have gotten that. If you haven't, um, we're going to send it out again. You can go to uh, www.bcbiofuel.com dot uh, org and the survey is on there. Come to me after and I, I can I can hook you up with the link. Anyways, so we did a survey and we got responses. And I'll be talking a little bit about that. We wanted to research and compare the existing distribution and uh, point of sale systems that are already around. So again, like I say, get a lay, a lay of the, the land before we start stumbling around in the dark anymore. And uh, and then really from there identify the gaps between the needs of the biofuel community and the existing point of sale systems, and then plan a collective approach for ongoing development of that ideal, universally applicable point of sale system. And fortunately, the collective biofuels, uh, biodiesel conference was coming up. And so I approached Lyle with this idea to say, look, we've, we've got something I think that's really important for the community. Let's, let's open this up and try and have um, this be a real uh, focus of the collective uh, biodiesel conference. Um, maybe have a panel discussion, try and get uh, people together who may already be working on this, may have ideas, uh, help with funding sources, whatever else, 
to bring the community together so that we can get a community solution that, uh, that we can all benefit from. And so a survey of the report is currently being carried out by, uh, by Jessie uh, Radish. I don't know if any of you know her. Uh, she used to be with the uh, Chicago uh, Biodiesel Co-op. She's a dynamo. If you need any kind of outreach activity, um, she is unstoppable. So uh, she went and did the survey. And uh, here's what this says. The preferred blends of biodiesel. Like, so basically what we're doing is we're gauging the needs. How many people like us need a whole blend of fuels? Well, not so much. But what we do find out is um, what we already knew. B100 is number one. Uh, so that's a great testament to the collective, uh, you know, biodiesel conference community. That that's where their dedication is. That's where their that's where their heart is. But certainly, if we're going to expand this out, though, we do need to start thinking of other fuels. And some people are already doing it. E85 on the agenda. So if we're starting to really look at expanding this out, uh, and you want sustainable fuel stations, that sort of thing, most people still drive gasoline vehicles. So maybe one day that'll be more on the agenda. Um, Pump type, yeah, so ancient mechanical, uh, question mark, who knows, most people still using fill rights, uh, I don't know why we got a two there, because I think we're the only ones using this one, none, so there's a need there, all sorts of stuff, so we're all over the map, nothing standardized whatsoever, what, it's basically, the pump we use is whatever we can get, if we have to buy it new, we basically go with the cheap ones, uh, fill right. I think you can get commercial ones rated for commercial sale there too, but for the most part, I don't think people are using those. System software, again, all over the map here uh, from, you know, mostly none. Mostly people probably have the trust system. Uh, they're distributing it out of, their, out of their facility. Who knows? So we see there's a real need here. And what do you want from a point of sale system? What is the perfect system? Okay, wow, there's, there's a lot there. People had a lot to say about this. So. Um, let me just seal it down and then just seal it down even more. Small mobile fleet fueling setup. So most people want something between 2,000 and 4,000 liters. Self-contained solar power stations with cellular wireless certified pump. Uh, so that's coming up. More and more people are recognizing uh, you know, the weights and measures issue. Uh, they don't always take that argument that you're a private club. They like to, you know, it's, it is the mandate. Governments like to explore their mandate or keep, keep their jurisdiction, not make it smaller in most cases. So that can be a really, really hard argument. So why not just try and use existing certified pumps that we can get surplus for cheap anyways? Fossil fuel companies are throwing them away every time they refurbish their sites. So um, an automated 24-7 online payment. Um, so that's the kind of thing that I think that, that people want. We have uh, a couple of systems that have been working on that. Um, and some of the other issues though, if we're going to look at doing something universal, these are other things that we have to take into account. Obviously the weights and measures issue, uh, people are looking at above ground versus below tank regulations because they're different in different communities. Tax laws, uh, declaration requirements, credit card payment systems, US versus Canada, uh, Patriot Act, uh, privacy limitations, that sort of thing. And so there's a lot you know, to think about here. And fortunately we've, we've got you know, and when we did the survey, it seems like there's basically just two groups that have been doing this. Uh, there's us. We've been, uh, you know, working on a, on a pretty rudimentary system in the Cowichan Valley. We have the have a bait system. We've approached it from a bit of a different direction than uh, Elia at the Baltimore Vines and Co-op, and he's, uh, you know, I think much further along with the um, the interface and the hardware. He's got something working here at Piedmont. He was getting a demonstration yesterday. It's a pretty slick machine. It's looking pretty good. And it actually solves some of the problems that we're looking at in the Cowichan, is that how to interface with the next pump and the next pump without having to, to redesign the wheel. So with that, um, we can, when we start to get to that, uh, that destination, the destination of being able to design something with widespread applicability, so that, uh, that meets the needs of more and more people, then we've got a solution that we can, uh, you know, move our local solutions to, uh, to maximize, I guess, the global benefit. To invite uh, Ilya from the Baltimore Biodiesel Co-op, he's going to come up and he's going to talk a little bit more about the technical details of the BDB 9000. And this is perfect for me because the one thing that I did not want to talk about was all the technical details. <laughs> so I leave that to Ilya. Thanks so much, everyone.
thank you so much for um, giving me some of your time to talk about this and you for keeping my like hey <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm Billy Goldberg uh, I'm not a founding member of the book but I've been a member essentially since its founding um, we are a um, collection of all the morons, obviously. Um, <laughs> that we, we actually, I, I think that before I joined, there was actually one or two batches of biodiesel main. But uh, quickly got tired of that, very quickly. <laughs> and decided, well, we have a bunch of diesel cars, and really what we want is to fill them up with biodiesel. There's no really other way to do this other than somebody had to buy it in quantity and then figure out a way to distribute it. <coughs> and that's what the co-op was founded. Right? So this is our location here, um, relative. No laser. No laser. <laughs> relative to Baltimore. Um, uh, this is kind of an industrial-ish area. This is a farmer's uh, market, indoor farmer's market and our um, pump is over here. So when we first started, um, uh, this is actually a newer picture, but before uh, we didn't have this system in there, so it was essentially uh, just the lock gate, um, custom welded cage around a heating tank, a heating oil tank with a containment tub. Um, we have the curved roof, because the roof, because that's a Baltimore thing, you gotta have that. <laughs> um, there is uh, and so over here you have your standard for the right pump, right, and it has the dial thing. And so we were open two days a week for eight hours total, um, every week. <laughs> Somebody standing there filling up people with biodiesel. Oh, here's a better picture of the filler. So, um, so that was in um, from '05 till. Uh, 07 essentially, that's what we did. And 07 we decided to um, make an automated system and I was, you know, like Brian very foolishly was like, hey, that sounds like fun. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, about a, it took about a year or so to get a prototype built um, and then uh, we put in our production unit which you can see here, and it's the exact same unit and identical to what um, Piedmont does in 09, and we've been using it ever since then. And it was funny because immediately our biodiesel sales tripled. Like within a week, we opened it up three times the number of sales next week. So it was like the really obvious where the bottleneck was. Um, there's no doubt about it. So that, this is what our prototype looks like. Uh, I required a lot of this. <laughs> um, this is what it looks like on the inside. Um, so it's hand wired uh, onto a, uh, this is a small industrial computer. This was before Raspberry Pi came along. This is a 200 megahertz Linux machine in solid state. It runs on a flash memory. There's no moving parts. And it has this header, and you can plug wires in there and <coughs> drive relays to do things. So that's what the prototype was. Uh, but it did read credit cards. As you can see, it has a credit card reader. So um, it reads the magnetic strip on the cards. Everybody has their uh, individual PIN number, which is not their credit card PIN number. It's a co-op PIN number. So, there are actually two phases that we use the credit card. One is to identify the number, right, by the name on the credit card. So we actually don't use any of the financial information on the magnetic strip, just the name. Name plus PIN equals, we recognize who you are, we're gonna open the door, right, and turn on the power uh, to the pump, and let you pump fuel, and then at a later stage, we actually transmit the financial information from the car to the bank and collect the money. And the system we use for that, the gateway, the gateway is the thing that you talk to, which is connected to your business account. So the gateway is literally the gateway between 
your credit card and your business bank account. And ours is Alphoys.net. It's uh, the second or third largest one of these things in North America, I believe. Um, so this is uh, in contrast with the production unit looks like. So it's a little bit neater wiring. It is a little stack of circuit boards here. Uh, there's a custom circuit board now, right, to run this. So there's a big relay here to turn off power to the pump on and off. This is a ABR microcontroller, so it's the same essentially chip as in the Arduino, if anybody's heard of that. Um, so it's like an Arduino plus a biodiesel shield in one circuit board, essentially is what it is. Uh, and it's got a bunch of screw terminals to connect um, um, fuel meter lights, electric lock, etc. Um, and this stack here, so that's screwed on to the face of this, right? So, um, and the LCD display, right? So the whole thing is on one piece of stainless steel, and then it just has a backing to cover all this up, okay? Um, so it's a, this design was a lot more, because we wanted to make now a handful, not just the one prototype, but make, make four of these. Um, and, uh, wanted it to be more manufacturable. So this is our first step at manufacturability from the prototype. Still, these boards, they're through hole through hole circuit boards they're called, right? Because you have to put in a component, flip it over, solder, flip it over, put in another component. You do that about 60 times. It takes what well, takes me when I'm not very good at this, about six hours to make a board. Not fun. Uh, but uh, same computer, it uses the, it's an embedded um, ARM computer. Uh, it uses a cell modem. It's one of those circuit boards there. Power supply, et cetera. Is that PC-104? Yeah, PC-104 form factor, yeah. Which we've moved away from since then. Too expensive, this? No, actually, this stuff, it wasn't the expense, it was the availability, because nobody cares about PC-104 anymore. Right. Uh, all we cared about really was power and the uh, screws, right? And uh, we used that. It was great because a lot of stuff you can buy just fits right in. Um, but nobody fits. I don't think it. I think it's sort of just disappeared. And yeah, there's a big market for it. It's funny you recognize that. <laughs> so this is our. Um, this is the thing I was writing in the earlier picture. Um, so this is our, it's a, a thousand gallon double wall tank, um, again a custom built cage, this time surrounding not the whole tank, but just the pump uh, supply stuff. Um, this pump actually is another fill right, this is a 12 gallon pump now, right, because we're running out of solar. There's a battery back here, so you can uh, pump, uh, use the pump 24-7. Um, it's a 12 volt fill right high capacity pump. Uh, and the controller, and there's no wires anywhere, right? So you can just, it's on a skid, you can just drop it off wherever. If you got sunshine, um, uh, cellular coverage, you're good to go. Uh, and, uh, this was at a concert venue here in Columbia, Maryland. We thought that uh, two buses would come fill them up and it would be great, except we haven't done that. We've done that at our old pump, like twice, like Cheryl Crow, Neil Young, saw them both. <laughs> Never at the concert video. It's a really bad marketing thing that went on. But anyway, it's a really nice system. It's kind of a showcase for us, you know, uh, completely self-contained, off the grid, solar powered, biodiesel dispenser. How much? Uh, it cost us about 8K to build. Uh, like, super nuts. So, some of the features of, of the system, and I think most of these are kind of common to all systems like this. So, you need to be able to buy, people need to be able to buy fuel with their own credit cards. 
we thought about a fleet system where we issue a card. One of the things, like I said, we all have separate day jobs, so we studiously, studiously avoided having to do any work whatsoever. So like if we had to put something in an envelope and send it to somebody, forget it. Right? We wanted it to scale infinitely, right? <laughs> Without us moving a finger. So we had to work on stuff they already had, right? Which is their credit cards. Um, so uh, we also wanted to, uh, people to buy and renew their memberships right at the kiosk at the pump. Uh, so the kiosk obviously has to uh, meter the fuel, so control pump power lights, electric lock, etc. Uh, because it's a co-op, we need to have some kind of member management thing where we keep track of uh, the amount of fuel each member bought, etc. Uh, the contact information. So there's a little whole like co-op member management software here, right? It's not on the kiosk itself. It's online, it's online, it's hosted by Amazon. Um, so one of the things that we discovered by trying to hook this up to different kinds of meters is that they're uh, vastly different digital outputs that these meters produce, some of which would fry our board and some wouldn't. Um, so this became actually a, a little uh, crash course project <laughs> in digital um, interfaces. Um, and I think that uh, we have achieved actually a universal interface that you don't actually need to know what your meter is putting out. It'll just read pulses of however they come out, uh, up to like 100 volt spikes. Okay, that's great. I mean, nobody, God help you if you have 100 volt spikes coming out of your fuel peak. Because <laughs> you're gonna die. <laughs> this, is, this is all uh, free uh, and all open source software and hardware. So we publish not just the code for the software, but also all of the designs for the circuit boards, the schematics, all of that. And uh, in homage to Rudy, I have to put uh, Richard Stallman here. He is the founder of the open source movement started the Free Software Foundation, wrote most of the code that runs on the Linux systems. Richard Stone. Where is the project? Is that SourceForge or where do you? GitHub. Okay. So GitHub, SourceForge is the old place where you did such things. GitHub is the new place. So okay. it's all, it's all good. I think they have a screenshot of okay. coming up. Um, so this is what it looks like when, so each member has a login to this online, uh, you know, their pages on the co-op site, they can log in. Uh, this is me, I believe. It's me, I logged in, but I can look at, because I'm an administrator, I can look at everybody's sales. So usually this says you or your family members, you can look at um, their sales since forever. Um, in my case, I can look at everybody. So this is our bunch of our recent sales. This is what the, sales sort of report looks like. Okay. You have your credit card transaction ID, <coughs> sale and all, pretty standard stuff. The only uh, trick and or nice thing about this is that it actually does uh, double entry bookkeeping. So it makes a sale which is separate from a credit card transaction and it consolidates them later, which is apparently the way you're supposed to do this, although or so I read. <laughs> uh, so this is what it looks like uh, for a member's, um, the membership page. So if you're a membership czar, you have a role in the co-op to sign up new members. You have a page like this. You can enter new members. You can edit existing members. You can edit everything about them, including how much credit they have in the co-op. Um, and adjust their email addresses and stuff. This is your own personal page, so you can adjust your own contact information. Contact information is important because this is the one and only way in which you get your receipts when you buy stuff, is you get it by email. We don't print receipts. Um, I'm just, uh, just blowing through these pretty standard sort of screenshots of what 
this thing looks like in real life. This is our GitHub page, right? And uh, so if you just look for BBB 9000 on GitHub, that's a little homage to HAL 9000. Um, so it's split into two parts. There's a kiosk part, which is the thing that lives next to the pump. And there's a server part, which is the thing that lives on Amazon online, where you log into. And after that main split, you have all the code uh, documentation. Here's a, the board layout. So this is a new board that we designed, I designed. <laughs> Um, the, it's a two-layer board, so we're looking at green and red are the two layers here. Um, this is the ABR now. This is a serial communication chip. These are all the outputs. There are headers, so there's a landing place to put one of these things. This red thing is sort of the Raspberry Pi equivalent, so, so again, a solid-state Linux machine. Right, that runs on flash memory, except compared to the old one, it's twice as fast and it costs $25 instead of $250. Very important. <laughs> um, and it's, it sits right on the board, and so it can uh, talk uh, serial interface directly to the AVR, the microcontroller, the Arduino thing that's sitting right under it. So it's right under this chip. So it's a little two-layer <coughs> stack, right? This we bought off the shelf, 25 bucks. This we have to make. And uh, if you have a keen eye, you'll notice this is all surface mount components here, right? So no more through hole. Why on earth would you do this for essentially prototype holes? It's crazy, right? We'll see in a second. Like one of the most awesome things that come out of like hobbyist electronics. We'll see in a second. Um, this is our schematic. So there's a PDF on there. Uh, there are also the raw files. So we use uh, what's called EDA, is the electronic uh, CAD basically. Uh, the software used for that is called PyCAD. It's an uh, open source watch platform. And it's free. It runs on Linux, Macs, Windows. And you draw all of this, and then when you lay out the board, it of course knows oh, what all the electrical connection is supposed to make, so it's very convenient for working on electronics. So these are the different pieces of this. This is our fancy new digital input setup. There's four digital inputs, um, because two of them we use for uh, the fuel meter. So there's two independent fuel meter sensors that will send fuel meter pulses. Because it's easier to replicate that circuit, even though we don't leave here, this senses your door latch. Um, and this one is uncommitted, so I'll auxiliary input. And a bunch of other stuff. The only interesting thing here it has a actually uninterruptible power supply, so it'll keep itself alive for a few seconds, enough to tell your online posted thing that I just lost power and shut it down. It, dutifully sends you an email if you're the kiosks are um, to let you know that bad things have happened and it's time to call in the cavalry. So here's uh, ending with this hot plate reflow. This is the modern way of making last well, time. Make it. <laughs> the modern way of making uh, uh, hobby like prototype electronics using circuit on components because nowadays you can't even get through hole components for a lot of stuff, right? So how do you make surface mount circuit boards? Well, so you get a laser cut mylar plastic sheet that has squares cut out of it where all your components go. And you line them up and you lay them on top of each other and then put in some solder paste you use a paint squeegee to squeegee this hard paste over this thing. And you lift it up, and oh, this is with the cover still on it, plastic, right? You lift up the plastic, and you have, you know, beautiful little squares of solder paste, right? Then you put all of your Brazilian components into the solder paste, and you put on an hot plate, right? And then, like magic, 
at a certain temperature, the whole thing reflows, the whole solder paste turns into a liquid. Surface tension adjusts all of your components. You don't even have to place them precisely. And so you can have fairly fine pitch components like this, you know, no problem. Very easy. This is, I don't know, five, ten times faster than doing this with a solder iron. <laughs> awesome. Maybe right. So the thing like this, you know, it's not crazy for us to say, you know, we could make two, three dozen of these things, you know, in a co-op or work session. You know, it's not crazy. With a soldering iron, it will be done. So it requires special skills. Here, all you're doing is using tweezers to plunk things into blobs of goo, where there's no special skills here. So totally doable for small-scale manufacturing. And that is it. Yeah. All right, so my heart is broken that we only have 10 minutes to chew on this. This is a fantastic session, guys. And uh, you are right, it's a bottleneck, and your product is brilliant. And we operate seven stations. My favorite is the Baltimore Biodiesel by far. Yes, Matt, kick it off. Yeah, well, I'm just curious. Um, so we had that meter that I had bought for the for yep. the Pittsburgh tank, and yep. apparently it was incompatible. It got, it got yanked out when the new system got put in, and I, I never quite understood. Was it incompatible? Was the pulse that that thing it's sent it? On, it's on its way to Baltimore. What? That meter is on its way to Baltimore. Why? Well, because yeah. they've got a weights and measures issue, and they want playtime. So your twenty five hundred dollar digital EPP meter is on its way to Baltimore. To you guys. <laughs> yeah. Okay, back. so it, it did work. It does work with that it system. It will work. It will. Well, no, yeah, if you no. choose to use it or not, it's another story. But it would work fine. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. That, yeah. No, I mean we're gonna hack it, and you know, we'll make it work, right? But I, when I bought it, I was told that it, I forget what the pulse to gallon ratio was, but it was a fifteen to one, or I forget what it was. But there was some. It was supposed to put out a certain number of pulses, then you calibrated it to a gallon. Well, no, on our screen, there's a um, operator mode. You enter into it, then there's a calibration screen. One of the calibration is your meter's K factor. So usually it's stamped on the meter somewhere. Right. But it's some, the K factor is simply the number of pulses per gallon. Right, exactly. Okay, so I don't remember what it was, but yeah, exactly. So you can type in any number you want in the calibration, and yeah. then it'll count for that when it's displaying gallons on the display. Right. Okay. So. Our meter, one of our meters, its K factor is 870 something. Another one is like 200 something. I know yours down there is 20. <laughs> that, that, that older one. So that was why I was confused because yeah. it was a nice fancy digital one and then it got replaced by the older one. And I just didn't understand if it was just wasn't compatible. Well, it's right. So the problem with the digital one is that it's not clear looking at it. I looked at it yesterday. It wasn't clear to me exactly where you would tap into it to get a pulse strain, which is a per gallon pulse strain, right? Which is all you want to feed into that machine. But it has the fact that. that you have an LCD it's and all so of this No, but it, it has so that. Thing. Enough, it must. That's good. It'll it's work. It's off top of it. Okay, We're on it. So and we, that's meter number one. It's used. It's on its way to Baltimore. They'll hack it. Don't worry about it. Let's move on. Yes, Tom. Um, I, I gather you're actually producing these for sale. We don't have to reinvent this process, right? Do no. You? Yeah. So we, you know, we're trying to do that, or we will try to do that. That's sort of what we're, one of the reasons we're here is to gauge interest in uh, how many people would actually pony up for something like this. What's, you know, in terms of it, electronics, okay, it's complete, especially in these ranges of runs, completely dependent, if you're talking about five units, 12 units, 50 units, 100 units, you have big drops in price, you know, and then you go up to like a thousand and then a million and et cetera. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah, but see, you can't even buy a lot of this stuff in that quantity, right? You can't buy a single custom circuit board, right? You, you can, you know, you have to buy five of them, right? <laughs> you know, so these kinds of limitations. So that's why it's a key question for us. If we, were to do a production run, how big is that production run? Is it, you know, five of these units? Is it a dozen, three dozen? What is it? I'll order yeah. one. Yeah. I'll order one today. <laughs> so we are think so the other the uh, time in question is how much would people pay? I mean, I think that 
Um, from a rough calculator, there's about a uh, thousand, just over a thousand dollars worth of parts in here, right? Um, and then there's putting together stuff, right? So clearly, I think that nobody wants to reflow their own boards unless you're a freak like I am, right? So we could sell, let's say, a board, right? Well, there's probably, I think, like $250 worth of parts on there ish. Uh, we would probably sell them for around like $250. Something like that. Complete board thing is programmed. It's ready to get you know wire terminals screwed into your lights, pump, etc. Right? But you have to do that. You have to do that anyway. Right? You have to put in the rest of it. Right? Oh, figure out how you want to mount it, etc. So, our, I mean, we're not a co-op, but our company's small. We really like the idea of having something like this, but there would be two things that we need from the system, because we, we do a lot of internal fuel sales, so like our own personal trucks and things like that, and we like to keep track of you know which truck's using what, so we can diagnose stuff. So can it, can it support like a fleet fuel card, like if we made up our own magnetic cards, could it live with that? And then secondly, would there be a way for it to sometime in the future support a blending pump? Like what they have up in BC. Right. So this is one of the. So I'll ask the. I answer the second question first. So this is one of the um, things that Brian and I have been talking about the whole time we're here. So we're going to figure out how to connect this pump, right? The blending pump specifically. I think there's enough sort of leftover inputs here that it wouldn't require radical changes to the hardware in order to support a blending pump, especially one that had. Uh, three or four presets, right? It's very different from a continuous blending kind of thing, which mm -hmm. I don't think anybody really wants. The other thing, I'm sorry, what? Well, right, uh, totally, like you a, put a, you do it by a pin number. So if you wanted to track fleets and you, you just assign a number per vehicle and all your record information would be kept as that vehicle. But like you, you'd have it on a card. So we don't have like 40 company credit cards. We only have one or two. Four. So if we, if we is there a way to just have like a magnetic card that isn't actually a credit card? It just says so this is an right. account. You can yeah. do it with just the PIN number. Yeah, and, and I can answer that too. That's how our system works. You don't even need a card for our okay, system. Okay, so you, you just, just have a PIN number, and of course it works with uh, with the, the blending pump. So we have those those solutions, and Ilya has these other solutions. So that's the whole idea of of getting together yeah. now. Okay. Um, See, so okay. we've actually talked about doing a collective approach to to merge what we both learn and then make a more robust, more widely accessible solution. Well, count us in then. <laughs> Jason. So I have two questions. One is we're not a co-op either. Don't have any interest in membership or any of that kind of stuff. We just want to sell fuel 24-7. So is that part of the roadmap? And the second thing is there's clear a, a lot of unmet demand for this product. This time last year we were doing exactly the same conversation, just with maybe a different set of people. Um, can you give us some idea of the timeline? I mean, do we just sit back and wait, or is there anything we can do to actually make this really happen this year? Well, next so one, year? Of the, one of the effective things that has worked for this kind of stuff before is essentially one of the big things holding us back from this is that it's a risk and a financial commitment for us to make these things, to buy the parts to make them, mm -hmm. which we, you know, are really not in a position to do sure. unless. You know, so the way to make it happen today, right, is start writing checks. Say, okay. you so know, I want a 50% deposit. How much, How much capital? How much capital do you need? For, actually, let's go show up hands. Who in the room would buy one? So I've got, I've got one, two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I got eight. I would need to know his first question now if it can yeah. handle for public sector. Sure, the well, co-op. Co of course it can. Yeah. The co-op is a layer right. that you can add or not add. So it can yeah. be anything. But so yeah, yeah, we have mean weights and measures. Sure. Well, Absolutely. no, well, see, right this now, is the thing. So um, the way that the weights and measures electronic cash register, right, it has to be certified by weights and measures for retail sales, right? Right, they come out. They come out and we'll test it. Uh, it does. Yeah, 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 no, that's a, so that's a so separate it depends. Yeah, if, if they I do in North Carolina, they don't in Maryland. If, if I miss this object in that too, this is the actual perfect launching point for the panel discussion. Exactly. Because this is exactly what 
you know, we're, we're hoping to kick off here. Yeah. Is the next step? I have two slides to kick off to the panel discussion on this exactly. topic. Okay, so we're going to get over there. And the panel discussion starts now. Question, we have eight people going up. How many would take more than one of these? So, My give me a total count. Have I got demand for 20 of these? Including, in including your? Yeah, I, I mean, if I had the money, I'd buy six more right now. Actually, I could use nine more right now. And by the way, that little white unit you said, uh, turnkey, $8,000, it's a good price. I could buy three of those you know, today. So the trick is, are we at 20? Are we at 30? How are we at, 20? 20. 20. Okay, so we can handle 20 well, if, you, if you follow that up, I mean, in kind of a semi Kickstarter mode, is everybody willing to front load the capitals yeah, over another the world? Let's see, this, this is part of the feasibility study. Is we're the Kickstarter out program, program. <laughs> North America wide Kickstarter program for this also. So I say we easily won um, our own social enterprise, uh, kind of Dragon's Den on Vancouver Island. I think this has universal appeal, just like the organic food market does. You know that changed the paradigm, and exactly. so that's why this also <laughs> is the next the next thing. I think challenging okay. the choice. Before we go, before we go, restraint. Let's do that. Capital requirements: twenty thousand bucks, fifty percent of the deposit will definitely get these things built. No, so if we're good. selling them for two k okay. at, at twenty, I think we could. Half down. So it's a twenty thousand dollar nut that we're talking about. Everybody write their names. So we'll go get Carol to do the slow yeah. money deal, yeah. and yeah. we'll just do this. And we'll get yeah. you your money by noon tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing, though. Also, we also have the production bottlenecks and everything. We have yeah, the day jobs. Yeah, so there's all, all these things, things yeah. that we have to consider. <laughs> Thus, you know, yeah. Brian, get out of the paper. Anybody's looking at the info, you know what's happening.